It's 6 p.m. We will call the meeting to order. If we could start by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And meeting guidelines and safety protocols. So the purpose of this meeting is for the board to conduct board business. The meeting is open to the public and is recorded. You can listen to all past board meetings by visiting board docs through our district website. This meeting is being presented via Zoom and is not appropriate for audience members to interrupt board business or ask questions during the meeting. Agenda items will be addressed as listed in the agenda. And if you are here in person, the event that there's um, some type of emergency. You have exits both on that side as well as back behind us. And with that, we'll bring us to our vision and mission statement. Vision, our community inspires and prepares each student to thrive. And our mission, in connection with our community, the Squim School District empowers staff to inspire hope and provide flexible, innovative learning opportunities in a safe and respectful environment so each student thrives. Also, I'd like to do the acknowledgement of the land we stand on. Um, Director Johnston, would you like to do the acknowledgement? The Swim School District administration, administrative and school buildings sit on the ancestral land of the Sklalem people. While the Sklalem traditionally come from one nation. History has led to the formation of three sovereign Sklalem Klallam governance, governments. The Lower Elwha Klallam tribe located in Port Angeles, Washington, the Jamestown Sklalem tribe located in Swim, Washington, and the Port Gamble Sklalem tribe located in Kingston, Washington. The district's primary partnership is with the Jamestown Sklalem tribe. Today, the tribe and the district share a partnership that includes official consultation on program and funding changes that may directly affect American Indian and Alaska Native students, as well as holistic service planning for students to remain successful in their educational journeys. Great, thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to uh, 2.01, uh, the approval of our minutes. We have minutes for September 19th, as well as September 28th, and we are voting electronically, so I believe we're gonna, the preference would be to do one motion at a time, I believe. So I'd be happy to hear a motion regarding the separate September 19th minutes. I move we approve the September 19th regular meeting minutes. Thank you, we have a second. I'll second. Any discussion? Hearing none, please uh, vote when indicated. All right, and that motion is approved, and I'd be happy to hear a motion on September 28th, uh, board study session minutes. Move that we approve the September 28th board study session minutes. Thank you. Do we have a second? I second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, please uh, vote when indicated. All right, that motion is approved. And that brings us to changes or additions to our agenda. I do not believe we have any changes to our agenda. 
um, as it was posted. So with that, I would uh, take a motion on the agenda. I move we uh, approve the agenda. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All right, please vote when indicated. All right, agenda is approved. Brings us to our consent agenda. Do we have a motion and a second on a consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. A second. All right, any discussion? All right, please vote when indicated. Consent agenda is approved. That brings us to 5.01, uh, public comment. And for in-person public comments, we'll use the, uh, the sign-up sheet that's at the table. Virtual public comments will be done by raising your hand using the, the Zoom application. The raise hand function can be found down at the, the bottom of the Zoom screen. Sometimes you have to hover over the, the bottom area to bring up that raise hand feature if it's gone blank. Um, and in the interest of time, order, and respect to others, I do want to clarify, it's not appropriate for complaints or charges about employees to be mentioned during public comment. These issues should be addressed to the superintendent in writing, and the board superintendent or district personnel uh, typically do not engage in direct conversation or give feedback during the meeting. Uh, the reason for that is because we, um, we have a posted agenda that gets posted in advance. And if, if we were going to have a discussion about a particular topic that's brought up, we would want to make sure and provide that notification to the entire public that the board was planning on having a discussion about that particular topic. So um, with that, I will open up the floor for um, public comments. Do we have any, any signups at all for in-person public comments? Okay. And if we have anybody attending the meeting um, virtually this evening, um, and you would like to make public comment, you would need to do so by using the raise hand feature on the with contained within Zoom. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public comment portion of the meeting. And that will bring us to our student board representative reports. And I see that we have Hale here. Mm -hmm. We'll go to you first. Hi, Hale. Sure. Uh, yeah, I just noticed that we've had like a really exciting last two weeks here at the school. Like, for instance, last weekend was our homecoming. Uh, we had a whole bunch of spirit decorations provided by our leadership for the homecoming week, and there was a lot of school spirit that we could see. We also won our homecoming football game, which was really nice and exciting against Kingston. It was pretty close. And then our homecoming dance was great, and were, the students were really glad that they could do it this year regularly back to normal. Mm -hmm. And like I've also heard that a lot of students also think that we have a really good classroom environment this year. And one of the reasons for that is that they just feel it's a lot back to normal compared to the last two years. And I think that really is providing stability for a lot of students. And especially with like the AP deadline, like for pre-registration coming up tomorrow, I think a lot of students are going to be more inclined to do that because they feel that there is a better classroom structure this year and everything's back to normal. So I'm just really glad to hear that for students. And we're looking forward to high performance from all the students this year. Okay, right, under here. And so we don't have to. Did she reach out to you? I haven't heard from her now. Okay. All right. We'll hear from her. Okay. And that's gonna. We'll go ahead and move on to seven point zero one. We have um, a report from our, uh, our 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 director of transportation, I believe. 
So welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Fulmer. I'm the director of transportation for the department for the district. Um, here to present a report on the transportation for 21-22 school year. Um, so this month, our ridership is averaging about 1,500 students. Uh, we're up about 200 students since the first week of school. Um, we currently have 17 Gen Ed buses that are uh, running on routes daily. Uh, we have five special need routes that uh, run during the day, they run a and PM as well as a midday shift. Um, the department has 31 full-time employees, uh, consisting of 22 bus drivers. Uh, we have uh, six bus aides, one dispatcher router currently. We have uh, one mechanic and myself. In a typical year, we have six to eight substitute drivers and aides. Uh, we're, we're down this year quite a bit, considerably. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge uh, securing drivers, but we're actively recruiting. We have ongoing training classes um, that start weekly. Our, uh, our district fleet consists of 33 buses. Um, five of them are gasoline powered and the rest are clean burn diesel. Um, most, most of them are pretty modern in terms of emissions. We have 13 support vehicles, the white fleet, uh, as well as uh, maintenance vehicles and various pieces of equipment that we maintain for the district. Our fleet is inspected twice a year. Uh, once is a surprise inspection, and that happens from November on. And then we have an inspection in the summertime, which is a planned inspection. And uh, we've uh, received very high marks from the Washington State Patrol as well as OSPI uh, this year. And Year, you know, years past as well. But, uh, and lastly, we, uh, we're we working on this year's updated snow routes that should be posted by the end of the month, by October 31st. So uh, I'd like to get that out before the snow hits. Well, I do have a, a couple of things to add. Um, Director Fulmer is probably too humble to tell you, but he's been working with our admin team directly to try to improve the uh, intersection between our administrative team and the experience of school-based safety, school-based behaviors and discipline when warranted and make it a smoother transition. And I really appreciate you coming down, Rich, to our meetings and being a part of that. We're trying to get documents um, that are articulating the way that things will work so parents and students know that. The drivers um, need to feel well supported in that. And our administrative team is working really hard to make it a seamless situation so we know exactly when to get involved and when the drivers can handle it. So it's all about building relationship and bus drivers are the first people to see students every single morning. And I just can't say enough for how they do develop uh, those relationships on their buses. And I've had the fortune of seeing it firsthand because those in the central office that are helping with the um, crossing guard duty you see those kids get off the buses in the morning and there are so many bus drivers that have that in spades and it starts at the top. So I really appreciate Richard's leadership and his um, expectation that people really give it a go and his training, he is a recruiter. So we're working hard to support him to get uh, more drivers. So thank you very much. Any other questions from the board? I was just curious, how do we get new drivers? Is there like a certain kind of um, advertising that happens or are there certain um, things that you target for? I've been working real closely with Victoria. Um, we've got quite a few different avenues, but uh, it's just, I think, tough out there nationwide. It's, it's a struggle for, for drivers and aid. So, so we're, getting, we're getting a little interest now. We have some people in training. And I'm going to add about that, that the challenge that remains is we have folks who are interested. Some people are finding it hard to find housing here. 
And so we have a trained people with years of experience sometimes who really have to think twice. So um, we're just trying to be encouraging and think of new ways that we can uh, buffer that issue. Caleb, any, any questions down there from the, the student perspective around transportation at all or any thoughts? Um, like around how many bus drivers would you say were short this year? Um, on the gen ed routes for short three full-time, well, Two full time now, and um, in general, we have about six to eight in any given year before pre COVID. Mm -hmm. We have six to eight substitutes available at all times. Um, you just just want to uh, express, please share share with your staff how, how thankful the, the board is. It's a, an extremely difficult job, and I can't even you know the idea of keeping it safe on the road, but also almost having to have those eyes in the back of your head well the, the <laughs> mirror but you know to, to the, the awareness that's needed I, uh, sure. I i just i just commend all of our all of our fabulous drivers that's and, and then being that first point of contact and the last point of contact with our students is such a critical relationship so appreciate your efforts and please share our appreciation on to, to, to your staff as well thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, and thank you drivers and your staff <laughs> And the folks keeping them around. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And that brings us to our superintendent report. All right. So um, this evening, I wanted to focus on a few uh, topics just so that you're aware of where my uh, time and energy is being spent and prioritized. So there's a segment of my time that right now is continuing to be heavily involved in community engagements and I'll share what uh, some of those are. And then there is a, a significant uh, push on the professional development side, especially around aspects that are unique to Washington that I need to be sure I'm up to speed on. And then of course we have uh, some of the listening tour work and the safety work that has come since the beginning of the year. So just to give you um, some ideas around community engagement, um, I've been in attendance at the SQUIM Realtor Association as a speaker, the SQUIM Education Foundation, uh, Sunrise Rotary, and um, also have been out uh, to just get myself familiar. Marin and I were at the library expansion meeting recently, getting a feel, and by the way, just as an aside, beautiful project for the library. I have to give them a shout out for their thoughtfulness and for including all of us and seeing what our community could have. It's, it's impressive. So um, I wish them well with that campaign. Uh, making sure that we are uh, having my presence at aspects at schools that can be supportive. And that is a direction that I now really do need to turn listening to her wise we're going to have two more sessions in october for veterans and so we've made some outreach to veteran organizations to let them know this will occur and it's very well received and also alumni at the end of the month and we're going to do that by zoom so all alumni who would be interested in attending who might not even live in squim can still participate and we're also going to encourage uh, faith-based organizations to come on, at, come on out uh, to that event on Zoom because we know there's a lot of intersection there. But it is time to turn towards the schools as well. So I will be scheduling with principals to get out to meet staff members. I will be holding staff-based listening tours. And then I'll be working with Kalem and Zara in the next two months to get student focus group opportunities so that uh, students have access to the superintendent and can share their insights. I really look forward to that. Um, I'd also like to let you know that uh, the Olympic ESD is very supportive. Of course, I went to the first student uh, superintendent advisory meeting. And one of the activities that we did at that meeting was through their relationship with Kitsap Strong, which is basically a community effort around uh, student success in the community. And I'm really hoping to bring some of those resources to us so we can have an experience both as a board and also as an administrative team. 
because it's very eye-opening about a student's journey through our educational system and how resource allocation matters. So I look forward to that. And also to let you know, I've, I have met with the Swim High School Athletic Director, Craig Brooks. Um, there are many, many aspects on tap for development around our athletics, and, and uh, we're going to be prioritizing those together and talking about what future needs are. One of the future needs I'm hearing, just so you know it too, is a call for uh, an athletic trainer who can have a higher degree of presence. When we have so many athletes who are participating in outside athletic teams, travel teams, um, athletic competition has escalated in its intensity. And with that comes, uh, of course, re repetitive motion injuries, um, hard playing, hard working um, injuries. And it just would be very helpful to have an expert um, available to us. So that is something I'm talking with them about. Um, I would like to say that uh, safety has been a priority on my calendar every single week. Um, I have met with the ESD safety um, threat assessment coordinator, and we have actually calendared a series of trainings for staff around threat assessment and then moving into uh, safety protocols for uh, response to crisis intervention and um, serious issues such as active shooter and how we can really integrate appropriately at the right developmental levels. So we'll be including all of our staff in trainings of that nature, including inviting our bus drivers. So we wanna make sure we're having a well-rounded approach. And then we'll start talking about student involvement as well. And Kalem, I'm sure you're gonna help me with that. Okay. Um, we did have a strategic plan study session and we'll talk on that in a little bit, but I would say uh, it's been quite a robust uh, month and my learning around the frameworks for both principal and teacher evaluation, I'm doing both of those through AWSP and also through TPEP for Danielson training. Uh, it's really important that we have a good understanding and uh, I think those trainings are accomplishing that. Any, any questions? All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's going to bring us to 9.01 board vacancy discussion. So just wanted to, I know this was posted, but just wanted to bring the board uh, up to date regarding the, uh, the, the plan for the, the timeline we have um, based on feedback that I think the board um, had, had discussed about um, hopefully getting uh, getting things in place relatively soon um, so that um, if we get the, uh, the appointment taken care of and that, that will hopefully happen well before um, or before November would be would be great. Um, so we have October 10th, which is the uh, the initial deadline set up for at 4:30 p.m. for receiving applications. And then October 17th, we set up uh, for interviews. Um, we did set up a, a um, preliminary date that um, may have a meeting or may not. That would just be based on if there happens to be, um, for those of you that took place, um, all of you, except for Mark, I think we're, we're, we're in the capacity where we had uh, uh, more than more than others that have submitted. And so, uh, at some point, when we um, we would need to narrow it down to those those five, so that's why we we scheduled that meeting. I believe it's on when Wednesday the twelfth. Yeah, may or may not need to mm -hmm. so just depend on how many candidates we receive. So, um, so we would interview on the evening of the seventeenth, and then have an executive session after the after the meeting to select the person that we, evening. We would we would be, have some time to discuss. During the executive session, session we would we would do no selection. Right, the selection attendance. happens after. Yes. After. Got it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And but it plan. would be the, it's all the same evening. Yes. Same evening. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and I know it's been posted on the website. Any any questions from about the process? 
Do I dare ask if we've had any applications? We we have had a couple. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But I think, especially based on the timeline and it being the third, we have until the uh, the the tenth. Um, you know, I'm hoping for more than more than more than just a couple for us to consider. So I'm hoping the word gets out there. And also want to want to mention and just while the community is listening as well that not only can candidates uh, apply but but also they can be nominated as well so somebody else could potentially nominate somebody and um, that's always just something to consider too because a lot of times it's it's somebody else and I would think that they would probably have a conversation with the individual first but <laughs> it's um, yeah reaching out to somebody else who you know what I really think that that you might be great at that. And sometimes it's, well, it might not be on that, that individual's mind. There's when somebody else makes that recommendation, maybe they start to think about it. So, uh, but yeah, we do want to make that part of it. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, would we be developing um, a set of questions for these candidates or would we just? Yeah, we would. Yeah, I think we, we still have our, our, um, our questions that we used during the last appointment, which can be um, modified. And yeah, so I would imagine that we could use that as a, as a starting Tempor place, but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and the, the process that we used before, and again, we don't necessarily have to do this. I mean, I welcome feedback from the board, but um, we we presented the, the questions to them and then but then they did have a a, a set timeline and mark can probably remember this <laughs> probably, this is probably very very recent in your memory yes, but yes. A, a set amount of time at which to to answer those questions and so they um the, the candidates would would be managing their own time accordingly for those questions yeah so we send them the questions ahead of time so right that's what i meant about yeah. Yeah. And one of the qualifications is to remind everybody that they need to be a resident of District 3. Correct. Yeah. That's which it. is the east. It's a very large area, but on the uh, eastern end of Squim yeah. and yeah. area and yeah. of the school district and yeah. south. And it actually goes into Diamond Point. Correct. Mm -hmm. And even even as far as, because um, it even crosses into Jefferson Garden. County. Yeah, Garden. Garden, yeah. So. Garden, yeah um, so. And I believe to the south, if I'm not mistaken, does it enter into the Bell Hill mm -hmm. area as well? Yeah. So, and I know the, um, just for folks to know, and it's right on the main page, one of the slides on, our, on the website, swimschools.org, one of the slides, five slides that come up has a link that you can click on. And part of the application packet that's online is shows the map. So you can sort of zoom in and, and, and see really close. And in fact, we have a, well, we'll be talking about the map too. That's another agenda item. So I assume that if they want to know if there are in District Three, they can call yeah Central Office and here's my address. Or yeah, I would say they could probably call call Tracy directly, and we can we can confirm if there's any any. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. So all of um, District Area Three is all well, it looks yeah. orange. I think in that one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Glen, Bell Hill, even um, even off the, the river, river this I guess be the south side of River Road mm -hmm. to a point. Uh, yeah, it's quite a quite a broad area, and then to the north, all the way um, all the way to the coast there. Uh, the district down. two is basically Squim, North Squim. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of places, District One and District Three actually border each other right. on the uh, south side of One Hundred One. Yeah, I believe the uh, well where it starts off is is it um, Squim Squim Avenue that sort of divides it, Washington and Squim Avenue. It kind of runs north. Yeah. It zigs and zags. Oh, it does. Yeah, I guess it does. Or not a problem, but that yeah. challenge. Where do I live? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you um, uh, for bringing that that aspect up, Larry. Um, it's an important detail to know <laughs> for sure. So, any other questions about that? Okay. 
All right. Um, and evaluation of capital project uh, priorities. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Regan. You and I have had discussions about this already, but I want you to kind of lead us off. So um, you do have a hard copy of this presentation um, if you'd like to follow along with it. But um, what I'd like to share is that we have had uh, a couple of months with me being out and about on the listening tours and safety forum, of course. There have been uh, conversations and events in the school district. And uh, our capital projects manager, Chris Mafori, myself, and many members of the capital projects kind of evaluation team. Darlene is here tonight. She's a critical member of that team. Bo um, Young is here with us as technology director. He's been an integral part as well. We've really been assessing where our capital projects priorities lie. And when you have new information or new um, demands, you need to be looking at what your resources can do. So tonight's presentation to you is really to introduce this and we have Chris before with us on the line. So I'm gonna go ahead and just give this uh, snapshot presentation and then we can ask him any specific questions that you have. And Darlene is here as well, or Bo to talk about either finance or um, technology to the degree we can, right? So tonight my theme is around intersections and the world of and. Intersections I bring up because what I've recognized is through the listening tour sessions and also the safety forum meeting that we had in this very room, there are so many intersections between those issues that are important to stakeholders in our district and capital projects. Facilities comes up time after time after time. We know safety has come up uh, many a time as well, so I, I recognize that's the case. I also would say to you that the world of and is a mindset I'd like to ask the board to be carrying with you through this presentation. Because many times with resource allocation, you think it has to be an either or. But what we've really worked hard to do is think of how can we say and we can do this and do that by thinking about how to do things in phases smaller parts or completely reconsidering how we do something at all. So just keep those things in mind. Okay, camera surveillance, air quality, the elevator project and the track. These four things have come up time after time as projects that need to have what I would call some level of attention or reconsideration. And so those are the four areas I'm gonna to speak to you about quite quickly tonight. What does reevaluation mean? Well, the way we've approached it is the sense of urgency that the project may have surrounding it. Also, what level of priority would we give the project depending on where it needs to happen and when? What level of reconsideration does a project require? You know, when you have information at one point, you make the best decision you can, and then you get more information along the way, you should be reevaluating all the time. That's a dynamic system. So we're trying to employ that. Now, we also have to recognize this, many of these projects were capital levy projects that were promises when people voted yes. So we have an obligation to be sure reconsiderations keep in mind what obligations are too. And then we have action steps for fulfillment. What I've heard at the listening tour safety forum from you, um, you know what? It's great that we talk about things and plan for things in the school district, but you've got to be more than that. You've got to take action steps and show us some progress. So I'm going to talk to you about progress tonight. So let's just take each one. Camera surveillance. We've decided this is an urgent need. And it's an urgent need because we've had safety response that actually was kind of uh, handicapped because we didn't have the camera surveillance that we needed. So what we did was make a shift to priority of tier one for the camera project. It was already in the capital levy, but we moved it. And then we came to the table after the events at the start of the year with the graffiti, the safety forum, and we reconsidered 
if the project had to be done all at once. And we realized there is a place for an interim project and then a long-term comprehensive pro project. And what's really important is that interim gets the job done for that urgent need. We address that. Where we don't have surveillance, we need to have it. We've assessed where we need to. We're asking a lot of people to get in on this conversation and help us. Then we have a comprehensive solution that comes on that's future focused. So we're not gonna do that as fast because we wanna slow down and make sure, are we getting all of the components of a future focused surveillance plan? Because it's not just cameras, it's key access. It's thinking of all the new technology that comes every month that we should be thinking about. So that is our, our plan. The action steps, we've already had the assessment meetings. Um, Darlene and Bo have been uh, at those. And I have to say Bo has turned from some really challenging opening expectations with all the phones and the cameras and the uh, laptops, but he's really helped with Chris to think of the solution for the interim because we're planning on that for winter break, Christmas vacation. Okay. And then the scope. What is the scope of an interim versus a comprehensive solution? How can we integrate the interim with the comprehensive so it's not a waste of money, it's actually a, a phase in? And then solicitation. How do we go about soliciting the expert advice, the expert plans, and the focus that we need for the future? And those things are all underway, and Chris can speak a bit to that when it's his turn. Okay. Now air quality. Air quality is an important need. It does not have the safety urgency that the cameras may, but it is of course important to us all. It is currently a priority tier three, but we are having consideration of moving some things up. And what we're able to reconsider for this is what I said earlier, we break the projects up into bites and do what we can. But how do you decide what to do first? That's the action step we're going to be taking. We've already started these discussions about scope. Which scope projects could we grab right now and that we have the cash flow to do this? And I am eventually going to talk to you tonight about levy funding and how it works. We don't have all the money at once. So we have to make judicious choices and make sure cash flow works. What immediacy of benefit will be derived if we move a project forward? There's no sense to do something that just sits and waits for its sister project to get done. We want to do things early that actually will result in something better for our students and staff. And the reason this is important as a need, related to safety, the first week of school, as I was walking around the campuses, I was seeing that we had a number of doors that we call lock and prop. That's when your door is always locked, but we give permission to prop it open because you need to have the airflow. It was so hot I and mean, Caleb's nodding right now. We had teachers saying, I just can't have the kids in here with me with small little windows. We need that. And that was very challenging for me to hear because of course we have the safety issue, lock all the doors down. So I know that air quality improvements are safety need because then we will have the climate control that we need in the rooms. Caleb, I'm sure you can remember that. Yeah, okay. Next, the elevator has come up. And so we heard about that, um, not only at the safety forum, but I've been approached about the elevator at different uh, venues I've gone to as a speaker. And of course, we should all remember that the elevator was there to promote ADA access to our board meetings, to having access to speak to board members, to access superintendent, and the compliance for ADA, it's a value we certainly hold, but it also is a compliance obligation. So it's a key factor. But the priority is to provide access and to be sure we're doing that. And what we recognized was when we went through this exercise that we did for the cameras and then the air quality, we could put the elevator through the same paces. And we recognized that right now at the central office, there had been a shift in how different office spaces were being used. So since that decision was made, departments had moved into different spaces. I think, Bo, your tech department's one of those. 
So in looking at it again, the building layout is now different than it was when you were asked to make that decision. And so I'm coming to you tonight to say, we have potential here to still get both the world of and we can get the ADA access and potentially have a boardroom that actually lives on the first floor, has multiple entrances, <coughs> meets the ADA, could serve as a space for students, and we don't have to put in an elevator. Um, the action steps, the time to completion for the elevator project is a year out. Elevators apparently are quite popular uh, in this post pandemic world and the delivery date is at least six months to 12 months out. Um, also the escalation in prices at the time the elevator project was put together, the price point was very different than it is now. And we've assessed that we believe this could be a changed project and uh, we can get everything we were hoping for. We would still need to finish off um, office space in the district office so that the group that lives in the first floor now would have a home, but have considerable cost savings in doing so. So um, the grant revision, this project was never paid for by levy funds. It was not approved for levy funds. If this was all grant funded, we would need to do a grant revision and be sure that um, we have qualified expenses. What I can see from this one is that I, I see there would be um, freed up funding to go to something. And on the next slide, you could see one idea. Track. Track has come up uh, numerous times in my listening sessions. And I wanna talk about uh, something that Calum actually helped me to see. Uh, when I was meeting with the board representatives, it was brought up to me that the track really is a situation where students don't even have an opportunity right now to train for what they need to go do in competition, much less host a competition here. So this isn't about us saying the students need a better track. They need a workable, usable track. And it's a high priority because we aren't even providing training access for the students. They're having to go off site. They're not having a home area in which to prepare. And I find that to be a safety issue. You know, students, when they train, they're getting ready to have competence, to have coaching, to make sure they feel comfortable in their environment. And while I have a shout out to all of the athletes and their coaching team, because they obviously have had some great results, even though the track hasn't been top notch, um, what could it be? Potential is the next question. So in all of this reconsideration, we recognize that we could potentially find an earlier project tier for the track and that there would be an improvement, of not only the need, but also the opportunities students could have. And the action steps we need next are to assess the scope of the project because I'm hearing, and I have to get this all verified, that the size of our track along the size of the interior football field is not adequate for state level competition. And that is something I would hope for us to consider remedying because when you build it, they will come. And if we can have regional and state competitions here, everyone buys their coffees and comes to the game and squint. Everyone goes out and has lunches and squint. I really think it's something that builds our community, not just our, our teams. So we're looking at an interim possible solution, just like we have with the cameras. Is there a way that we can put some type of Band-Aid measure on the track so they can practice, at least have practice? And then what will it take to have the venue that we can all be proud of and that actually meets the needs of the student athletes for multiple sports? It's you know track, of course, but there are other uses as well. So all of this to tell you that I've come to the place where I recognize stewardship 
of our funds and resources is what our community expects. It's what our students need. It's what our staff really hopes for. And if we have stewardship of the ideas they're bringing, which happened in the listening tours, if we had stewardship of the input and we're getting input from everywhere, the finances, we're trying to take very good care. And I can't say enough for our finance team and uh, Winnaha working with us, they are moving with every question we're asking as a team, trying to find that last penny and the opportunities are here. So what I'd like to bring to the board is that uh, we have Chris on the line to answer any questions, but I think what I would ask is for the board to talk tonight about reevaluation of any of those projects, um, but most pressingly the elevator, because if we would reconsider that project, we are at an ordering deadline if we want to have that project done in a year. And if we think the reconsideration works for us, then we can move on to look at it differently now. Yep. Thank you. So, yeah, we do want to open it up for, for discussion. And I, um, it, um, I talked to Regan a little bit about this and I just wanted to like, keep all ideas on the table. And I think that, that um, what she's bringing to us does from my perspective anyways, this seemed to make sense. I, I wonder if before we jump into the discussion, if you can elaborate a little bit on um, some of the discussions that you and I have had regarding ADA access to to other offices. Because I was, I was always less concerned about, um, you know, getting where the boardroom would be. I'm we're kind of perfectly comfortable here, or somewhere else, but I also, it was expressed to us um, by, um, uh, other other staff or your predecessors about the ADA access and and other offices and that and so I wonder if you can just speak to that at all about sure. whether or not that access is still needed or how we, how we meet those needs. Sure, and we have Chris on the line too, okay. so I'll start Chris and then um, please add. Uh, Caitlin, thank you. Have a good thank night. You. Um, the district office is a 1928 built okay vintage. And I would say to you that uh, there are structural changes. If you make them to a, a building of that age, you do run into obligations to go with ADA compliance throughout the building. But we're not in that situation right now. Our obligation is more of a values-based obligation. We all value that we have ADA access to the building. So if we go ahead and have the first floor a boardroom that is accessible. Uh, we would not have access to the second floor, but the obligation would be that, for instance, if you want a meeting with a superintendent, I come down to you and I have the meeting. And what we do have is a commitment from our office staff that that makes perfect sense. That would be exactly what we'd like to do and uh, really come to people instead of expecting people to come to us. Okay. Anything you'd like to add, Chris? Um, yeah, when the, uh, oops, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. When uh, we started the discussion on the project, it was based on uh, basically this designation of this location. Uh, it was never really considered to go ahead and change the location um, after we started down this path. Now that we're talking about a different uh, method, one of the things that we discussed about is the area that's currently business office and HR uh, switching places. So once we actually started looking at that, the square footage of the boardroom design that we've been working on and the loft, the modular space, uh, multi-purpose space would actually be able to be reutilized downstairs. Uh, but the space that they have there is actually larger. So one of the things we conceptually talked about is now we could actually make meeting or individual or privacy meeting rooms for exactly what uh, Superintendent uh, Regan is talking about, potentially things like uh, if it's an HR question, we could have a room that's more soundproof, more confidentiality, more privacy, or if there's something that there's a complaint that the uh, that a parent or even a student needs to talk with the superintendent, having more dedicated spaces for that, that were never really considered in the first place. Um, 
the current layout of the boardroom didn't allow it. Now, that being said, from an ADA standpoint, if we do move it down there, the priority for ADA is public access. So if it's private workspace, it's a little bit of a different, different situation. But for public access, it would allow us to more look at the exterior of the building and the egress to these spaces that could be utilized, um, which are much smaller in scale, much easier to implement, um, and actually take much much less to modify the building as you already have some ADA accessibility as it is. So once we started this conversation, it did change the way we we're looking at uh, addressing the concern and addressing the need. Uh, so it, it, there is a lot of opportunity here to, we'll say, shift gears, get all the expectations, um, and actually it looks like a possibility to, for giving even more functional space uh, for use both with the public and with the, uh, with the staff. Um, yeah. I don't have a question, but I just want to say that I think it makes a lot of sense with such a long term project like this with all of these tiers and all of these uh, well, tiers in many respects, but all these years that we're working on this that needs evolve and that the project is it's it's not the Bible. It's something that we we can manipulate and use and change as time goes on as our needs adjust. So I think it really makes a lot of sense to revisit and really think about our changing needs, especially with the changed use of the building during this period of time. So it just, um, I'm, I'm grateful for the um, opportunity to really think about what we need now. And changing the boardroom to the first floor makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, one of my priorities with the boardroom or the elevator originally was ADA accessibility. So I still want to make sure that we we have ADA accessibility. I think Chris mentioned this. What can we for the egress? What what things can we do? We do we need to do to make it more easily accessible to all people coming to performances in the auditorium, coming to board meeting and um, meeting the superintendent on the first floor or you know that sort of thing so i think we need to have a high priority still on ada accessibility it just not may not be with the elevator in my understanding on the elevator all the uh, engineering and plans have that been completed already i mean um, if we decided to do this in three years or whatever a lot of the, uh, the basic schematics and architecture engineering have been completed. Is that true? Yes, this was one of my new learnings and I'll let Chris speak to the specifics, but what I realized in this reconsideration was that um, the elevator structure was actually a separate structure from the building. And so we now have the design completed for this and we can access that at any time it belongs to us. So we didn't lose in it. We just have come to a place where we see the design. We know that it is modular to the building. So if we get to the place where we're ready to do the ADA compliance throughout the building, we'll have it um, prepared to go. Accurate, Chris? Yes, um, I can say that say it's 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, the codes that are changed for elevators are not significant. Um, there are enough that it could be just slightly modified to the design to code update it or whatnot. Um, but the key important parts like routing for electrical sourcing, uh, structural development, all of those things are not gonna change. So you have a usable design that could be used a decade from now at another time when, it, when there's a, a a more urgent need for it. And if we switch gears, um, I don't see it as a loss because it's, as Superintendent Regan mentioned, we're still dealing with escalation that works with design as well. So you're saving that that being completed now um, for future use. I really appreciate the reconsideration of looking at the, uh, the cameras and safety, you know, the doors, all, all that safety and security. And what can we do now that's still part of a, our long range plan, but has immediate needs for right now. 
instead of waiting. That was one of the things I heard at the listening mm -hmm. tour. They didn't want to wait. Why don't you just do it right now? And um, I think it's very good, you know, take a look at that and try to accommodate that as best you can. And so I, I applaud you for that. And of course, I've been a, a, an advocate of doing something about the track, you know, being a former track runner and track coach. You know, there had to, there has to be something, you know, we get somebody in there to look at it. What can we do to patch it up so we can at least practice? You know, and then the bigger problem or the mentioned is, you know, regulation size soccer field and football field difficult to fit in that skinny track. And so the whole track would have to be re-engineered and white. And that's a much bigger project. If we wait to fix the track until we can put in a brand new turf field that meets all the standards so we could run uh, league championships or, you know, that sort of thing. It, it's several years down the road and a huge um, undertaking. So if there's a way to get something in there to patch it so that we can use it, it wouldn't be perfect, right. but it would be usable and safe. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as a former sprinter, as a walker or a jogger, the condition of the track right now is just fine. But as a sprinter, you're going around some of those areas full blast. You don't want to hit those um, spots where the track no longer exists, like you're almost running on asphalt, because that can really throw you off. So I, I applaud our track athletes. You know, we got relay teams and sprinters and runners that did amazing in spite of the track. But I agree with you, uh, you know, having to practice at another track after they're through with track practice isn't a good solution. So we, anyway, we can get an expert in here to take a look at things and say, okay, you can do this, you can do that. And that'll, it'll take care of it for another couple of years until we can get a brand new track in there. That's, that's great with me. And I, I think that applies probably to a lot of the things that are on that list. And I guess just keep us at, I know the and, if we move things to tier one, that means some of the things in tier one have to be moved to tiers two and three. And so we'll generate some unhappiness there as well. Well, one uh, point I didn't make yet is that why we're able to do some of this is because we've had some cost savings. So some of the technology projects that we had initially in tier one, we have seen some savings there. And so we're trying to use that in, in tier one to fund other things. So cameras are certainly top of that list. And then looking at uh, breaking apart the HVAC projects and uh, going ahead with one or two of those. Well, I think it's an excellent um, ongoing dynamic kind of situation. And Chris, I'm sure Winaha is up to the task, but you know this is a can be a pretty significant seed chain into your Gantt chart or whatever you have to uh, the flow chart you have of how things are going to be done in SWIM, and all of a sudden we're going to have to turn it upside down. So you're you're ready. Well, to be fair, I've been doing that ever ever since I started last year. So <laughs> uh, that isn't a problem. The, the real the real key is making sure we get timely decisions and make you know make these movements before we invest too far into these projects where it doesn't make any sense. Um, like Superintendent Regan was saying, and I've, I think I've stated in the past, one of the things we looked at was there was a very, very large chunk for these HVAC systems, but then we found additional grants to help fund the front, co front loaded costs for these. So that frees up levy funds in order to shift around and make changes and, and react um, in, for these priority shifts. Uh, the, the technologies decreases are very much helping the savings that we're finding in those are very much helping as well as really taking a look at not just where commitment is, um, but where cash flow plays out to the out, uh, outflow of cash against when we're actually committing these projects, making sure we're not over committing um, 
over committing the phases if we have to in order you know write partial contracts with extensions a later a later or whatnot uh, designed into the contract so we're not overextending our funding as required but at the same time we know that the bills for lack of a better word are not going to be due for six eight ten months out so how does that change how our cash flow works and that helps us reevaluate how we can change these priorities Thank you. I just want to say I, I'm, I'm just really pleased to see this flexibility and I think the sign of good leadership is somebody who is able to listen and um, be, be flexible, um, adjust to changing circumstances. Families need that kind of leadership. Businesses need that kind of leadership. Like you said, it's very hard to budget for a, pro a project, you know, two or three years earlier, and then conditions change, circumstances change. And, um, you know, the idea that, well, we just have to march along on this plan because that's the plan we made, you know, is, um, it, you know, that that's not being responsive to the community. It's not being realistic. Um, it's not serving our students and our families and our staff. And so to be able to say, hey, look, you know, let's take a look at this and see what we can do and, you know, be creative and still be responsible. As you said, you know, be good stewards of our funds, be good stewards of our facilities and um, see what we can do to address immediate concerns and needs in a responsible way um, that the money that we're investing, even for some of these maybe short term fixes is not just something that's gonna be wasted when a long-term fix comes in, it's something that incrementally will build to the final result, um, but will allow some, um, you know, will allow improvements in um, conditions like so the air quality, you know, and I think those are the kinds of things, you know, I, uh, Superintendent Nichols says a lot, you know, keep your, be careful about the shiny object, you know, because some of the things that are really out there that are really important aren't that shiny, you know, air quality, not that shiny, but really important, you know, because it affects our kids' health, it affects their ability to pay attention in class, it affects the teachers who have to teach an environment where either the air quality is not good, the temperature is too hot, the temperature is too cold, you know, I mean, every, every all of those conditions really matter. And so um, I just think it takes sometimes some courage to be able to say, I know this is what we were talking about doing, but we've taken another look and we think we ought to pivot a little bit here. So um, thank you for doing that. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a good steward and helping us, giving us the leadership to allow us to say yes, we, yes, and we would like to do this. So, and Chris, thank you as well, because I know you've been having to be, you know, pivoting daily, if not hourly, um, but we, we really appreciate the, um, uh, the steady leadership that you have provided for us and the guidance. And um, I'm just, I'm, I feel really good about what we're doing going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more, obviously. I, um, I think um, if, we can, if we can prioritize items that, uh, that will have some immediate impact to our students um, and, or, or the safety of our students mm -hmm. and staff, um, then I, I think we can, as long as we're, we're, we're okay from a compliance perspective on, um, on meeting, meeting needs and not just a compliance perspective, but meeting the needs of those who are, who are visiting our facilities, I should say, whatever. The, so it's not just about dotting the I's, crossing the T's. It is about meeting those needs and, and accessibility. And I should say to that end that um, in this process of our team anyway, really looking at this so that I could bring ideas to you tonight, um, we have had an offer of an ADA compliance audit for the areas that we'd be looking at and beyond so we can start a future focused plan that staircases to the place where we'd hope to be. And, you know, a 1928 building, that takes a lot of work on many levels, not just ADA. So uh, I think we will be saying yes to that and start in and uh, do just what you and Larry were emphasizing, make sure that we're attentive to the egress portions and access is paramount, especially for the downstairs. Yeah. I, um, I, I am 
sometimes just cautious about the about the interim solutions because I and I, and I know that it's it, it's great if the interim solution does become part of the, the the comprehensive solution whenever possible and I'm not sure if that's something that is possible with the track or not but it would be it would be great to make some some connections there I know that's easier said than done but um, well Chris is always a partner so that yeah. will be our next our next conversations okay yeah. excellent so yeah anything further with that or? no I just would say to you that if um, you know the elevator decision was a grant based project so when it comes to grants that's typically something that's administrative so we will just um, change directions as i'm hearing um, concurrence with that um, if it was something where you had to make a pivot with a capital le levies project really significantly that might be something that i'd say a vote is important but i think in this case we will revise and move ahead okay okay very good and thank you, Chris. And I think that brings us to before we go. Oh, yeah. Chris, is there anything else you felt needed an update or you wanted to mention? Um, I did actually have two items I wanted to mention just because we didn't go back to the discussion of the surveillance. Um, one of the things that we did in our team having the conversations we've had, uh, and this is where Bo has been very pivotal in this discussion is we're looking at the 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 changes in talking about steps and phases, the changes in the completion of the fiber optic network network that was the first project for uh, technologies has now kind of given us an opportunity to look at a different method of providing an interim solution that's more current to technology uh, with that that's not antiquated technology or trying to, we'll call it patch, an existing system that isn't working. So that we started looking at that and we started looking at whether or not, even if we say we have to put in something that maybe have to be taken out, uh, cameras that aren't going to be used in the whole comprehensive system, can we find a home for it? One of the things you're talking about is can you reuse the materials? Can we look at where, 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 where we can utilize this funding, even if it maybe costs a little more because you're handling things twice, but it's not stuff that's being wasted and we're coming up with ideas to do so. So that's one of the things that uh, to me is one of the things I, I'm, I'm appreciating, both Bo's efforts on that, John's efforts and Superintendent Regan's, Darlene is helping work with me on trying to figure out how to move all the pieces. Um, but it, it is very important that we take these things into consideration very seriously. And we've already enact, started to enact some uh, put out some plans, some concepts and such to get feedback from the staff and uh, staff in the, uh, the community. So we should see more of that information here coming forward, but it's definitely something where we've actually looked and started to find real solutions for an interim, not just stating that we have solutions. You know, we're not stating that we're going to try to have solutions. So just want to touch, touch base on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I think that brings us to 9.03, uh, strategic plan process discussion. And I'll get back to you. Okay, so as you know, last Wednesday night, we had our first board study session and we'll continue to have one of those almost every month. And we discussed strategic plan. So I just wanted to bring back to you that um, that future focused work, um, the time we spent really looking at the present plan and where the strengths were in that plan and where the opportunities lie for the next plan was very valuable to me. So I appreciate your time um, talking that out. And just for everyone else's benefit, this process really brought us to a place where we all concurred that a student focused plan for the next iteration was going to be a priority. And uh, I just happened today to go uh, both yesterday and today to a student voice conference with Dr. Tammy Campbell. And uh, it was incredibly eye-opening, 
motivating and inspiring. And I just cannot wait to meet with our board student reps and get busy with um, what we could be doing with student voice. So I will tell you that our strategic plan process will be heavily tilted towards students, um, which of course, that is the best tilt we could have because their perspectives matter and it will change their engagement in school. Uh, so I just wanted to bring to the board tonight for consideration that we move forward to have me facilitate the portrait of a graduate process for the development of our next strategic plan. The goal would be that we would have the uh, skeleton of that plan completed by June 30th. And then we would move into the next year to complete all of the um, performance indicators that we would want to measure to make sure their plan is working. Because one of the things we noticed about our current plan is they are goal statements, very well intended. We've made progress on some of those for sure, but we didn't really know how to measure it because there was no measurement element there in the plan. Uh, one thing I do want to say very clearly is that moving toward June 30th, there are going to be competing interests for our time. And the competing interests that I'm sure of are aspects like this, making sure that we're following our capital projects emphasis. We're really trying hard with that. We have a budget to put together that's going to have significant challenges, we think, this year. So that will take a lot of our time. Um, we also know that we're going to have um, negotiations coming up with our employee groups that will be very important to have uh, timeliness for. So we'll have to kind of monitor uh, what our intended calendar becomes as a reality. And we talked about flexibility tonight. I would just ask for that in this process too, if we need it. We'll be doing a call out for stakeholder groups to be involved very actively. I'm gonna start the planning process with the students and get their ideas. And I'll be back to you for updates if this indeed is a direction that you would like to go. Any, um, any comments or questions? I, I'm all in favor. I, I was on the uh, strategic planning committee that wrote the current one, and it, there was a lot of people involved, and there was a lot of hard, wet, wise thought put into it. But um, you know, I think it's time to, to move on to the next step or the next iteration. You know, we've talked several times about um, making uh, our school district even better, moving to a new standard of excellence and success for students and kids and the whole staff. So you know, I'm all in favor and kind of excited about this project. But the only complaint I had that you introduced this to an educational researcher that I've been reading and spending way too much time looking at uh, his work because it's somebody I really hadn't heard of before and I'm finding them very, um, interesting and thought provoking at the same time. You mentioned um, all these, you know, with the budget, capital improvement, um, the negotiations coming up, all of the entities involved in that need to be involved in the strategic plan. Um, for example, I mean, our strategic plan speaks to what priorities are we going to shift? What do we need to reconsider in the, the capital levy projects? Um, it speaks to uh, the budget. What, where do we spend our money and how in the most efficient way? And it's because it meets, it moves us toward the strategic plan we're working on. And then um, the negotiations and the various agreements. I mean, it, it, if, um, our staff or members of the um, organizations are in tune with what we're trying, what the strategic, they're part of deciding what the strategic plan is going to do and why, and why it's of value. That may alter, affect, uh, form the direction their negotiations. I mean, they may ask for different things because they're excited about this idea of um, collaborative whatever and or that this is the direction we want to head 
and all of them come together. I mean, uh, they're all important. So I, it's going to be an exciting process, and I'm looking forward to it. So. Yeah. Thank you. I think this is a great time to be <clears throat> embarking on the strategic plan, in part because um, we've just come through a very, very transformative event of COVID. And none of us are the same as we were before, and the schools aren't the same. And so it's really an opportunity for us to uh, sort of turn the page and begin to envision uh, this new future for ourselves, taking into account all that we've been through for the last two or three years. So I think it's really perfect timing for that. And the part that really intrigues me the most is the student portrait, because I, I think that's such a lovely way to uh, get to the heart of what we um, in the schools are trying to accomplish and how we want to serve our students. And so I will be really interested to see how that portrait develops. And uh, and I, I think it's headed in the right direction. So thank you. Okay. okay. All right, then we will move forward and uh, get planning for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. And I believe that brings us to uh, 9.04 redistricting review stage two. And um, just to kind of put this back on folks' radar, this is a result of the, uh, the recent census that was done. And we, we do have three different districts that, um, that represent, um, the goal is that it, that it stays um, proportional with, with where, where folks are living so that there's not an unequal balance of, of people. And um, the main point is we wanted to make sure and just publicly announce that we will have a, a public hearing regarding this decision, which will be on October um, October 17th, correct? In their October 17th meeting. So that the public is aware that if they want to make comments on this change, that they, they have that opportunity. Um, the change is not a not a not a major change. Um, do we want to pull it up and just um, just to show folks? I think the best page that sh kind of shows the changes on page twelve of what you're bringing up, Tracy. Uh, it shows it's basically um, the the center district area. Um, two is expanding and district area one is decreasing in size essentially. And if you see that um, where the black line is, um, district area two is, is highlighted in the green, but the green will expand to fill in all of where that black line is. If that, uh, so it, the space that it's, well, it looks yellow on my screen, kind of yellow ish. Will um, the, the yellow that is within that 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 black line will become green? Can you call out the rows? I mean, what rows are we seeing? Yeah. Um, we'll zoom in. Anderson some more. Road, Clark Road. The black line goes. So let's see. Yeah. So that's Oyster down. House Road. Olympic Stage Street Drive, Klein Spit Road. So the, the population change. So you're saying that um, area one, district one is, is growing. Losing. Yeah, so it's losing these people. It's growing, so it correct. had to move people right. to, to, to district two. Basically, yeah. district two. Right, yeah. it all sort of. Right. So it's all, right. all balanced. Right. Most of the growth, you know, I mean, opportunities for growth in SWIM for the uh, 2030 <laughs> census is either east or west of SWIM. Yeah. Not, not in the, yeah. Two years. That, that area looks like um, all on Marine Drive um, in that area. Like Maine's farm stays in District One, but uh, some of the streets over there, by it, it's difficult to see for sure. It's the area just west of Three Crab. Yeah. 
So this is on our website, the yeah. Yeah, and I think it's also important to point out that this this only applies to candidates that run for mm -hmm. school board. Right. It has nothing to do with who you you are voting for. Anybody mm -hmm. that's any registered voter in the Swim School District, regardless where you live, if you live within the Swim School District, you, you can vote on all right. school board positions. Right. right. And so, this just to clarify in case, and this redistricting has nothing to do with which elementary school you go to. No. Correct. Correct. Another good point. So I just want to make sure you understand that you actually are being asked to approve this tonight. So it's not up on our website yet because you have an approved change. Oh, next week. Right. Next week. We're approving the change and then we have a public hearing. No, the, we, we the public the hearing next, comes next, first, next, which is not the public tonight. hearing. Right. Yeah, we don't approve it tonight. No, no, no. But it does give an opportunity for us to present it to folks, and then if they have a have a public comment, they uh, they will have that opportunity on the seventeenth. So, is, is there any other major shifts in due to the census, like between us and uh, Port Angeles District, or us and uh, Port Townsend? On our other side, I don't think the census um, yeah, the involves outside, district the line outside, boundaries. Yeah, boundaries. The outside yeah. boundary stays the same. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. just changing what's inside. Sure. Yeah. So, and I, I know that um, they, when they when they go, to, they don't make these changes. With they, they try to very intentionally not make major. Major changes when they try to like, right. how can we make this change and that the impact be as minimal as possible too? So, I think they're very uh, deliberate about where they where they draw the lines to where uh, maybe the least impactful. One of the questions we did bring up because there are some districts that don't have district areas. We had um, early on asked uh, Larry yeah. if you might have been the on Port the Angeles. That, they're just all one district. Right. And I, but they're was, grandfathered in. But yeah. since we are districts, we cannot go to a correct. one size fits all. We had asked if we could just just have all at large, all at large yeah. positions, but that was. I mean, the, I think the, basically the law says no, you can't do that unless you start it up that way. Yes, and that's what Port Angeles, their situation. Is. Yeah, but um, and then this would all be in place. Well, basically, the importance of this would be in place for the 2023 election of school board. Correct. Or it wouldn't have anything. To, you're gonna have to worry about it for the current well replacement. There's no director. There's no impacts to director area three. No impacts on. So it's just. It's just one and two. It's one, just one and two. One and two. And I checked. I still live in one no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I missed your opportunity to carve out, you know, run my house. I think that, and there, I, I believe that there are, there's yeah. certain stipulations around, and yeah, even exactly. if, if someone were to move or that sort of thing, we still serve remaining terms. I think and, until the next yeah, election. Yeah, so, yeah. unless you move out of the district, yeah. support, that, that's a different situation. But yeah. So, okay. Um, I believe. That is everything on that topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. So we will be um, meeting. Well, unless there's there's in further announcements um, regarding other meetings, our, our next regular board meeting is October seventeenth. And um, but but stay tuned just in case there's other other items that come up. I do have one announcement that um, we are going to be launching the CTE facilities work group this week that you approved a couple of meetings ago. And so we're really looking forward to that. And we have quite a list of attendees who will be coming to that. And then also, I just wanna take this final opportunity to say thank you publicly to Director Stauffer. Um, I do feel coming on board, um, you've all been such a help and he absolutely gave me great insights coming here around legislative issues, um, the way things work, and uh, gave me some background on some longstanding uh, issues and considerations. And I just sincerely appreciate that. So uh, I do know that in the future, we'll probably be able to 
have him receive some type of uh, token for his uh, service, but I certainly appreciate that. Absolutely, yeah. And he uh, recently just uh, finished up with um, um, kind of his, his, his last duty with us, which was serving um, serving on our behalf regarding the, uh, the WASDA um, gen general, 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 general Assembly. General Assembly, so um, appreciate his, uh, his, his work there. And there'll be some, um, I'm glad you brought that up because there is gonna be some additional information that I'll probably share with the board um, regarding um, ranking our priority items. So, so stay tuned for that information. Um, two other just kind of good of the order notes. Uh, it is National Principals Month. So I want to make sure and um, just uh, uh, commend all of our all of our principals. It's, uh, it's, it's a tough year from their perspective too. And um, I appreciate all the hard work that they're doing through all these you know every year is a change of some sort but we have you know we have new principles in place we have just just a, a lot of changes happening so and also today is national custodian appreciation day and so i i want to just just i you know i think of I, I know that there's just an impact but even at the student level as well i mean sometimes we talk about those meaningful connections that students have with those adults Sometimes it's not always the teacher. Sometimes it's it's um, can be a custodian, and of course that that of course goes without saying with all the all the support that our custodians provide within our buildings. And um, but but sometimes it's they're they're also of course interacting with students a lot of times. Too. I still remember my grade school custodian yeah. mm -hmm. with a deep affection. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Even it's, though we may have missed the day, you know, there's something we can do for National Principals Day or. Custodian's Day at some point here in the <coughs> future, just to, you know, uh, something nice and fun. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. We could even have a you know donuts, yeah, or something like I, or something else. Something that doesn't cost make a car, make, make a mess car. either. Right. Not, not glitter. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. No problems. No glitter. <laughs> no problems. <Yeah. laughs> but I mean something. Something. Yes. Well, we'll think what's, about what's that. appropriate and makes sense. And uh, you know, who will help us decide. Students. Yeah. They're, Excellent. Good. They know how to. They know how to play. Yeah. yeah. They know how to play. Anything else? Good to the order. All right. We will adjourn. Seven twenty-six. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.